Ready. In this episode, the aviation of Essex-class aircraft carriers, Terror of the Pacific Ocean. The outcome of battles in the Pacific Ocean during World War II didn't depend on the primary armament of mighty battleships anymore. Often, opposing ships didn't make a single artillery salvo and couldn't even see one another through binoculars. Pearl Harbor, the bombing of Tokyo, the clash of aircraft carriers in the Coral Sea, the main characters in these operations were the carrier aviation. In the first year of the war, the Japanese army achieved a number of significant victories and captured almost all of Southeast Asia, while the Imperial fleet was dominating in the Pacific Ocean. Imagine a small island country controls a territory 17 times bigger than its own and with a population five times greater. However, it's one thing to conquer, it's another thing to retain it. In the summer of 1942, the Japanese suffered a crushing defeat in the Battle of Midway. It's after this victory that the Americans started active offensive actions. Japan manufactured 18 aircraft carriers over the course of the war, not counting those commissioned before the war. Meanwhile, the U.S. economy could accommodate the construction of 150 aircraft carriers. Essex-class aircraft carriers became the main striking force of the U.S. Navy and were pivotal in the war in the Pacific. The air group of Essex-class ships consisted of four squadrons. Reconnaissance, bomber and torpedo bomber squadrons had 18 aircraft each. The fighter squadron was reinforced and had 36 aircraft instead of 18. It was a timely decision. These were the fighters who gradually started to win in the Pacific skies. In the early years of the war, the primary aircraft of the U.S. carrier aviation were the Dauntless dive bombers and the Wildcat fighter planes. They showed good performance, but became obsolete by the beginning of 1943 and needed to be replaced. Modern Avenger torpedo bombers were the first to appear on the flight decks and in the hangars of Essex-class carriers. Grumman TBF stroke TBM Avenger torpedo bomber. Maximum takeoff weight 18,268 pounds. Engine power 1,900 brake horsepower. Maximum speed 276 miles per hour. Armament 2 times M2 machine guns. Caliber 0.5 inches. 1 times M2 machine gun in the upper turret. Caliber 0.5 inches. 1 times M1919 machine gun in the lower turret. Caliber 0.3 inches. A torpedo or bomb load up to 2,000 pounds, including 8 times 5 inch HVAR rockets. Avengers took their rightful place on aircraft carriers, while the obsolete Dauntless and Wildcat planes were replaced by the Helldiver dive bombers and the Hellcat fighter planes. Grumman F6F Hellcat fighter plane. Maximum takeoff weight 15,410 pounds. Engine power 2,250 brake horsepower. Maximum speed 380 miles per hour. Armament, 6 times M2 machine guns. Caliber, 0.5 inches, 2 times 500 pounds, bombs, and 6 times 5 inch HVAR rockets. Hilkert. The Hellcat was the most mass-produced fighter plane of the U.S. naval aviation during World War II. U.S. engineers installed a more powerful engine than the one found on the previous model, the Wildcat, thus improving the flight characteristics. The new fighter had greater maneuverability, speed, as well as fuel and ammunition capacity. 
In the last two years of the war, Hellcats shot down more than 5,000 Japanese aircraft, contributing to two-thirds of all victories of the U.S. carrier aviation in dogfights. The F-6F has one of the best ratios of victories to losses in the Pacific, 19 to 1. That means that for every Hellcat lost, 19 Japanese aircraft were destroyed. The Helldiver was the most ambiguous plane of the Essex's carrier aviation. Curtis SB-2C Helldiver Scout Bomber. Maximum takeoff weight, 16,652 pounds. Engine power, 1,900 brake horsepower. Maximum speed, 295 miles per hour. Armament, two times Mark II cannons, caliber 0.8 inches. Twin mount M1919 machine gun in the upper turret, caliber 0.3 inch. Total bomb load up to 2,002 pounds, including eight times five inch HVAR rockets. This aircraft wasn't easy to handle. The landing gear legs of these machines would literally collapse the moment they touched the flight deck, while braking barriers failed to catch them. However, Helldivers had some noteworthy advantages. They were fast for a bomber and were able to sustain serious damage. The shortcomings were fixed in the later versions, but the pilots kept their prejudice against Helldivers until the end of the war. The F-4U Corsair fighter bomber was the last to appear on Essex-class aircraft carriers. Vought F-4U Corsair fighter bomber. Maximum takeoff weight, 14,670 pounds. Engine power, 2,100 brake horsepower. Maximum speed, 448 miles per hour. Armament, six times M2 machine guns. Caliber, 0.5 inches. Two times 500 pounds bombs. And eight times five inch HVAR rockets. The enemy nicknamed it Whistling Death. When the aircraft was diving, it produced a sound that scared Japanese soldiers to death. Thanks to excellent speed characteristics, Corsairs took the initiative in battle and became one of the best combat aircraft of World War II and the greatest threat to the Japanese army and fleet. Every flight operation had difficulties for US pilots of the carrier aviation. On top of combat against strong adversaries, pilots had to show their skill during takeoff and landing. Aircraft could be sent on missions in bad weather or at night. A nighttime was uh, kind of a nightmare. It was, of course, dark. We only had red lights operating on the, on the flight deck so that our eyes didn't dilate. And uh, on this ship, it required uh, movement of the aircraft, which was rather unusual. As our operations day would begin, they would take half the air group, put them on the flight deck at the rear, uh, fill them all with gasoline, bombs and rockets and ammunition, and then they would start them up and taxi forward, and then they would launch them. As soon as they were launched, they would bring up the other half of the air group, position them at the back, fill them with gasoline, bombs, rockets and ammunition, then start their engines, have them taxi forward, and then launch. And usually just as the last one was launching, the original group that went was coming back to land on board. After they landed then, it was necessary to taxi forward and park the airplanes along the, on the side of the flight deck in a parallel position. And then after everybody had recovered from the launch, then all of those airplanes were moved to the rear using tractors. And then they were refueled, got new bombs and rockets and so forth. This went on for 12 hours a day, and you can imagine what a, what a circus this became on the flight deck. It 
it, it was very, very dangerous. The uh, people who worked here were very young men, but, and they did a very dangerous job. And they did, it, did a very good job of it, too. Air groups of Essex-class carriers had their baptism of fire during the raid on Marcus Island on August the 31st, 1943. During that time, the U.S. military strategy consisted in a systematic removal of the Japanese from the conquered territories. The task force's aircraft were destroying Japanese aviation at airfields, demolishing defensive fortifications on islands, and attacking the enemy fleet when it tried to interfere with the troops' landing. As a result of these local operations, the Japanese army was diminishing by the minute. In the summer of 1944, during two days of battle in the Philippine Sea, U.S. pilots of aircraft carriers from Task Force 58 destroyed more than 90% of all Japanese carrier aviation. By the spring of 1945, the U.S. fleet was reinforced with another five new Essex-class ships. The Japanese had nothing that could oppose them. The U.S. carrier aviation sank five battleships, including both super battleships. First Musashi and then Yamato. They also sank 11 aircraft carriers, 14 cruisers and many other enemy ships. That's when the Japanese command turned to their last resort to change the situation in the sky over the Pacific Ocean. The spirit wind became the main enemy of the U.S. fleet. Kamikaze is translated from the Japanese as the spirit wind, meaning the wind that must crush the enemies of Japan. Battles in the Philippine Sea made it obvious that the training of Japanese pilots is much worse than that of their U.S. counterparts. Apart from that, the United States were producing far more aircraft than Japan. Under these circumstances, the Japanese command decided to bring back the spirit wind tactics, which could help them prevail over the United States. To this end, they recruited conscripts that could barely fly an aircraft. They had a single mission, take off in a plane stuffed with explosives and fly it into an enemy ship. However, not only inexperienced pilots participated in such attacks, Rear Admiral Arima aimed his plane at the U.S. aircraft carrier Franklin. Essex-class heavy aircraft carriers remained their main targets. Kamikazes could act individually, in pairs, or even in large squadrons. During the last year of the Pacific War, they succeeded in damaging eight Essex-class ships. However, it didn't have a significant influence on the balance of force. Not a single aircraft carrier was sunk. Even the seriously damaged USS Franklin CV-13 and USS Bunker Hill CV-17 were able to get to the Pearl Harbor base without assistance. No spirit wind could save Japan from a defeat in World War II. In July and August of 1945, the U.S. carrier aviation delivered mass airstrikes on the Japanese territory. The last ships of the once mighty Imperial Japanese Navy were destroyed at the Kure Naval Base. U.S. historians call Essex-class aircraft carriers Pacific Champions and Masters of the Pacific Ocean. Pilots of the U.S. carrier aviation shot down more than 9,000 enemy aircraft in dogfights, and almost half of them are attributed to planes launched from Essex-class ships. The powerful U.S. economy crushed and broke the aggressive samurai spirit by the end of the war, and the Essex-class ship's air groups made a very important contribution to the victory of the United States in the Pacific Ocean.
They were designed to be the best. They met enemies face to face, endured tragedies and enjoyed victories. They went down in history due to the bravery of their crews. They are the ships that deserve to be called Naval Legends.